Hello everyone, Amanda Copatillo here from Career Services. Welcome to our faculty spotlight interviews. These interviews are intended to provide our students and community members with the opportunity to get to know faculty and how their academic and career paths have led them to Mesa Community College. We are going to be speaking with Pamela Lazardi from the Administration, Administration of Justice Department. Welcome to your spotlight, Pamela. Thank you. So today we'll have a series of questions for you and then we'll have some bonus questions at the end for you to answer. Uh, so our first question for you today is, uh, please introduce yourself and tell us what classes you are currently teaching. Well, my name is Pamela Lazardi um, and I currently teach um, Intro to Criminal Justice, Criminology and Victimology. Okay, and what are those classes? What can you tell us about those classes? What are the entail? <laughs> Well, all of them, criminal justice or the administration of justice is a three pronged um, system. It includes policing, the court systems and corrections. And so um, a lot of the classes that we have fall into one of those categories. Criminology and victimology also fall, it can be used as electives for us, uh, psychology classes as well. Um, so intro to criminal justice kind of basically tells you about the three parts of the criminal justice system. Um, criminology tells you the criminal side or why people commit the crimes they do. And victimology tells us um, all of the wherewithals and the parts about who are victims and who, you know, one of the things I always tell my students, I don't ever want them to forget is that there's never just one victim. There's never mm -hmm. just one victim. So those are the kinds of things that we talk about in those classes. Those sound very interesting to, to take. Yeah. Very interesting. Well, what did you want to be when you were growing up? Be a state highway patrolman. In Ohio, where I grew up, I was born in Louisville, Kentucky, but I grew up in Ohio. And where I grew up, there were no female police officers um, in the state highway patrol. And so I thought, that's what I want to do. I want to be one of those. And um, so I went marching down after I got out of high school to the recruiting station for the state highway patrol. And they said, you have to be 21. And I was like, <gasps> What am I going to do for three years? You know, <laughs> and um, so um, they told me, well, if you if you join the military and you go through the military police academy, then you don't have to go back through our academy when you get out. So that's what you should do for three years, and that way you'd have experience. And I was like, I'm going to go down and sign up. And, um, so my friends dared me to go sign up, and uh, and I they they said you won't be able to make it through basic training. And I was like, bet me. And I went down and signed up the next day. 22 years later, I got out. So, yeah, there you go. <laughs> well, did you go, um, where did you go to college and what was your major? So, um, I didn't go to college right away. As I said, I joined the military. So, I was in the military mm -hmm. for 22 years, seven months, and 19 days. And um, while I was going to, or in the military, I got my bachelor's degree in business through um, University of Phoenix. Um, you know, they had a cohort on the base where I was, and, um, we, and that's where I got my bachelor's. And then while I was in the military, I got sent to recruiting command, and I was like, I don't want to do this. Uh, you know, I went kicking and screaming to recruiting command. And But while I was there, the, the junior ROTC uh, instructor uh, at the high school where I was assigned to recruit um, got diagnosed with cancer, and they asked me to fill in for him in junior ROTC, and I did. And then uh, that's where I got my love of teaching. And um, so then I did my master's work in education and my PhD level work in educational leadership. And so, um, so I have a kind of a wayward path um, to becoming a teacher. Yeah, not the traditional pathway that students would normally think or community members would normally think. You go like from a college straight into the teaching area, but you kind of used your life experiences to get you to that teaching route that you're doing now. Yeah, and you know, I never, um, I, I didn't think I was, I had a, a full bird colonel while I was in the service. He asked me, why didn't you go to college? And I said, um, because I didn't think I was smart enough to go to college. And he's like, so on my, on my evaluation, he goes, okay, we'll attend college by <laughs> August. And I was like, you, you can't do that. He's like, I just did. And I was like, well, I'm going to fail math, so that's a waste of money. And he goes, starts erasing it and I'm thinking I got out of that and he goes we'll attend college math by August <laughs> I 
no, that's not fair. And he's like, do you want to get promoted? Then it's fair. And I, I started my college career actually at the associate level at Gilbert Chandler Community College right here in the Maricopa County system. So I am living proof that uh, anybody can do it even 15 years after high school. I took my first college class 15 years after high school. Wow. Well, and I think you might have even answered a little bit of our next question. It says, did you go to college with the intentions of getting the job that you have now? And what other jobs led you here to MCC? Yeah, so a little bit I've answered that. Yeah, um, no, I I um, never saw myself as being a teacher until, like I said, I went to the junior ROTC. Um, and when I started college, I, I, I just told you why I started college. I, I had no one. I know I didn't think I was smart enough to go to college and no one ever really pushed me. I mean, I had great parents, but they were all about my bro. I had three older brothers and they were all about, they need to get college degrees. They have to raise families and have children and all that stuff. And so they never really encouraged me to go to college. But um, this one um, Fulbert Colonel, um, Steve Hatz, I'll never forget him, uh, was the one that encouraged me to go to college. And, and you know, sometimes all, that's all it takes is one person believing mm -hmm. in you to, to make that decision. And you know, every day, so my, my work hours were from six to three. And at three o'clock that first day, th at three o'clock, he goes, where, I go, I'm leaving boss. I gotta go get something to eat before my math class. And he's like, you have your book? And I go, of course I have my book. And he goes, get in here. And I go in there and he tutored me every single day. Every day he tutored me. And I hope that I do that for other students to just let them know that just those baby steps, someone pushing you along and having that faith in you, um, will, you know, get you going. And then once I started, I, I just didn't quit. I was just like, finished my bachelor's, went into my master's, started my PhD work at, at NAU. Long story short, I ended, I ended up my PhD level work at here in Arizona at NAU. And, um, and I'm just so grateful that that one person believed in me and pushed me forward. And yeah, so that's how I, that's how I got to here. <laughs> yeah. Well, you've had a really like intricate journey of like different experiences yeah. to get you there. <laughs> specifically MCC, I, um, when I left the army, uh, my first job out of the army was, I was the training administra administrator for the Superior Courts of Maricopa County. And when I got there, I found out that all these people in the court system, and there's thousands of people in the court system in the state of Arizona, they all had to do continued education every year, 40 hours of continued education. And mm -hmm. they had no degree program for, for that. So when I first started at MCC, it was helping a gal by the name of Bonnie Black put together a, a judicial studies, an associate level program for all those people in the court system. And, and then that led me, obviously she was the department chair at the time for administration of justice. And then that led me to teaching other classes for her. And I've been here ever since, long time. Wow. Well, since you, you said you've been here for a while, what is your favorite thing about MCC? And what is your favorite part about working with our students? Two things. Number one, my favorite part um, about MCC is the support that I get, not just from my department, although I get a ton of support from my department head, the full-time staff in our department, um, uh, you know, uh, Barbara, I mean, she's amazing, but everyone uh, within, within MCC, people like yourself, that when I was uh, teaching in person out at the Red Mountain campus, all the support staff out there, it's just the amount of support you get from everybody. They just want everything to be right for you to teach. And mm -hmm. that's the way it should be. That makes it fun. Um, and then about the students, I um, was never able to have children of my own. And so um, after I said, I got out of, after I got out of the army, I worked at the court system and then got my degree in education. So I went and taught high school at um, Sholo High School here in Arizona, up in the mountains. And um, the students there and the students at MCC have filled this huge hole in my heart. Mm -hmm. And uh, I will do anything for our, for our students uh, to make, to, as I said, to let them know that there are instructors that want you to be successful. And, mm -hmm. um, and I want you to know that I'm here to help you. That's my job. You not succeeding, um, hurts, it hurts everyone. Uh, it doesn't benefit me if you don't succeed. It doesn't benefit the school and it definitely doesn't benefit you, the student. So mm -hmm. um, it, I'm all about just helping students succeed. That's my, that's my purpose for being here. Yeah, yeah. And you're right. We went and watched them 
we want to watch them kind of move on and transition into where they need to be and where they're wanting to go and meeting their goals. So, yes. Remember, I told you this story the other day. Um, so one of my students from that original program that I started at Superior Court, Maricopa, Maricopa County, one of my students, um, Deanna Lopez, started her. She had never had any college classes, sort of like me. And when I started that judicial studies program, she started it there at at the court system. She went on to finish her associates, her bachelor's, and went to law school and is now teaching at MCC in our department. Wow. And, and that's that's why that's why I'm here. People just like Deanna Lopez. Yeah, like you like you like to see them accomplish things and yeah. you don't do it just because you know it's part of your job. It's it's part of who you are as a as an yeah. instructor. Yes. Absolutely. A hundred percent. Yeah. What is the most challenging part about your job? Um, that that kind of goes back to the students as well. Um, I, I feel like sometimes our high school system or our public school system ha has failed some of these students um, when they get to the community college level. And and I saw it when I taught high school as well. Um, I spent a lot of my you know history. I'm supposed to be teaching history, and I end up teaching English, um, teaching them how to do research, how to write a thesis statement, all those kinds of things. And now that I just teach college, it's really sad to me that um, that I see students who fall in that same realm, that they, that, that a lot of kids who come to community college, the high school system or, or the system failed them at some point. They either felt like they couldn't succeed and go to university or they weren't prepared to. And I feel mm -hmm. like that's where the community college system cap. And so, that's challenging for me because you know, we only get so much time to teach our topic. And when we have to take part of that time of teaching our topic to teach them the basics, um, it, then it takes away from our topic. And I don't mind doing that. It fulfills, uh, like I said, it fulfills, I feel like I'm helping and that's a good thing. Um, and that's why they're there, but that's challenging as well. And, and you know, I guess part of our, uh, college, our high school system should be to fix that, but, uh, but I don't, I don't want to sit on the cap, but it is challenging. Yeah. Well, what do you like to do on your free time? Oh, my gosh. Well, um, my number one thing I like to do is yoga. Just did a class this morning, as a matter of fact. <laughs> After that stressful evening last night, I had to do yoga. Um, <laughs> so yoga, riding bikes, hiking, walking. Um, yeah, just being outside or, or just uh, stretching. You know, a body in motion stays in motion. So. Um, mm -hmm. yoga, I was, uh, walked with a cane when I left the military. And so yoga has given me back flexibility, balance, um, my life, um, really. And so, you know, those are the things I like to do. And then the social side of, you know, riding bikes, we get together with a bunch of folks and go on bike rides and go to lunch and ride bike back and, you know, that kind of thing. So yeah, that's what I like to, and travel. My husband and I travel all over the world. So, um, we, we, uh, in fact, this interview is coming from my RV, uh, today. Um, and uh, we like to travel all over. As I said, I never had children on my own. So I have three foreign children that we took in. We were their host family when they were here. And now they've been my kids ever since. Um, I have a Finnish daughter and a German son and daughter. Aww. that's I like I like to hear that. I like to kind of know yeah. a little bit more about, you know, what you all do and on your own time. And I feel like it just makes you so much of a I don't know, like, I know this, like a real person, not just an instructor, like you're, you're a human, just like the rest of our students. And it Absolutely. just makes you relatable and knowing that you, that you're providing, you know, resources and giving your time to people that eventually become a big part of your life is so incredible. Yeah, yeah. So our first Finnish daughter joined my family at 07, 08 school year. And every year since then, we have seen her, we've either gone there or she's come here until this year, COVID, the COVID year. Yeah. Um, and it just saddens me that I've had to go without seeing my kids. It really breaks my heart. Yeah, it is, it is. It's, it's just, it happens, <laughs> it's especially now. Um, what yeah. is your favorite part about, um, what is your favorite course to teach? My favorite has to be victimology. Um, mm -hmm. I think victimology is a really, it, it's a field that a lot of people don't know about. They just assume, that someone's only considered a victim if they've, you know, 
their home, that they've been, you know, something serious, raped, assaulted, uh, attempted murder, all those kinds of things. But the reality is um, victimology affects a lot of people and there's never just one victim, as I said. If it, so let's just give a scenario of someone breaks into your house. That's a more common thing. Someone breaks mm -hmm. into your house. So people assume the only victim is the person's house they broke into. Not true, because that, that person also has a job. Amanda has a job at, at uh, Maricopa County. So now it's affecting Maricopa County Community Colleges. Uh, Amanda may, may also be an adjunct instructor, so she may have students. Now this also affects her students. Um, it affects Amanda's family. It, it, it may affect people around her. And, and that's why you never know someone else's stuff. Mm -hmm. And when you, when you take victimology, you learn that people have stuff. And even, let's, just, let's just take today's world, the Black Lives Matter movement. A lot of people of color feel like victims, victims of our system, victims of their circumstances. And I always say, after victimology, you learn to be kind because mm -hmm. you don't know someone else's stuff. You don't know what they're going through. Yeah. And so that's why I love victimology. I always bring in, when I do in-person classes, I always bring in um, a mother of a, of a murdered child. Um, and, and there's never a dry eye in the place. Uh, it's always, you know. And then I also bring in a psychologist. And one of the things we talk about, and I do this online as well, but one of the things we talk about is T one and T plus one. So when there's a trauma, when there's a trauma in someone's life, um, the day before that would be T minus one. Mm -hmm. It would be the day before, no trauma. And then T plus one is the day after. And so that person after is not the same person as the one before. And mm -hmm. even when they go through the system and we talk about, you know, restorative justice and trying to make that person whole again, well, trying to make them whole is to bring them back to T minus one. And that's never going to happen because yeah. their life is going to be different from that moment on. Yeah. Whether that trauma was 9-11 or the COVID pandemic, or the Black Lives Matter movement, or the hashtag Me Too. I mean, this just goes on and on and on. Mm -hmm. um, that people are affected by stuff. And, and I love just teaching that to everyday people, whether they're taking um, it, the course to be a part of an administration of justice degree or a psychology degree, or just to take the course, because people need to know that the most important thing we can do in this world is be kind. Yes. No, you're right. I really, that is very, very informative for our st students to know because sometimes they just, they think it's all about facts and it's, but you know, yeah. you're right. And you know, everybody is affected by, by those things that happen around us. Absolutely. So what information would you share with our students who might be thinking about enrolling in one of your courses at MCC? I like to think that I'm fair um, and that and that I'm helpful. As I said, if they're struggling, like right now through this COVID situation, nothing is normal, <laughs> nothing. Mm -hmm. And um, my students, if, if, if they fall behind, the first thing I do is send them an email and I'm like, okay, what's going on? You were doing perfectly fine. Something happened. What is it? Um, and then I say to them, what can I do to help? What can I do to get you back to where you were successful? And, and sometimes they're like, um, I, I have a student today. I have a student today who's in the military taking my class online, um, and she's been an online student. And of course, the military has been prepping for civil unrest, should there be any during this mm -hmm. um, election era. And um, so she's not had time to be online and do her class. So she fell behind a week. And I noticed right away, I'm like, oh, wait a minute. And um, and she said, oh, my gosh, we've just been hot. And she wrote me this big old long explanation. And I wrote back, no explanation needed. You just could have put COVID or election <laughs> or, <laughs> you know, whatever, uh, because life happens. Life happens yeah. to all of us. And as I said a minute ago, it doesn't benefit anyone for you to fall behind and to fail because of a situation that we could fix. And if we can go back and allow that student to make up this work, make up this assignment, this assignment, and get back on track where you were, because you were being successful, you were doing perfectly fine, um, then that benefits everyone. It benefits the people in the class, benefits MCC in this case, and it benefits me as the instructor, and definitely benefits the student. So I like yeah. to think that I'm helpful um, and that I'm fair. 
Well, that's I think that's appreciated by a lot of students too, especially now and you know, and even if we weren't in this kind of you know situation, you know, that we're in now, if it was regular, like yeah, I don't think it yeah. would be regular. But right. you know, going back to you know in person and it's the same that that teaching style is fair and same, then they know they're getting an instructor who's very compassionate about yeah. the world, you know, around them as well. I like okay. to think I am. Yeah. Yes, I really appreciate that about about that answer and about you. Um, oh, thank you. How would you describe your teaching style? I would say that I'm a facilitator of instruction. I like to lead students to the information and then mm -hmm. have them find it. Okay. Um, because what I love about the field of criminal justice is those aha moments. Just had a student um, on an online discussion um, learn that spanking causes trauma to children later in life, that, that when, once they become an adult, that they could have trauma related back to being spanked. And, and to see that light come on uh, with a student is, is amazing, is amazing. Um, we'll go to the Black Lives Matter movement. When a child experiences some trauma due to parents being uh, questioned by an officer, handcuffed by an officer, put in the car by an officer. This child also experiences trauma and is now a victim. Mm -hmm. And that trauma also moves forward with them. And they feel less safe, not more safe around officers. And these are the things that we have to explain, that we have to get our general public to understand, that we have to make that right. Yeah. You know, and so I like to think that I'm a facilitator of knowledge. I like to lead them to the information. And then when they have that aha moment, that's one of the things I love to capture in my class. I always ask in, in my, um, I do little video blogs at the end of my modules. What did you learn? What was your aha moment? And what else do you want to know about? And I, I'm always, always excited to hear what was their aha moment, always. Yeah, because they're probably all different. Everybody. Yeah. You know, like Every you said, everybody one. has their own, their own story. Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. yeah. Well, Absolutely. what advice, well, what advice do you have for current and future MCC students who may be thinking about taking, thinking about majoring in the area of administration of justice and what types of careers can you get into by majoring in this area? I love this question because, <laughs> like I said, administration of justice is three pronged, policing, courts, and corrections. So there are three complete different fields within mm -hmm. the administration of justice. You don't have to be an officer. You don't have to be uh, a, a judge. You don't have to just be a, a corrections officer. I'll give you an example. But I like to use the courts because that's the one mo let most people know the least about. So in Maricopa County, there are 9,000 employees. 1% of those is judges. Mm. So, not, or, or, excuse me, 10% of those are judges, 900. There's 900 judges. So that means 8,100 are other jobs within the court system. There's, a, there's clerks of court, there's bailiffs, there's judicial assistants, there's um, the victim's advocacy program, there's CASA, the court appointed special advocates for children. Um, mm -hmm. the, the list is so long, I could just keep going on and on and on and on. Um, and so there's so many opportunities other than just being an officer within administration of justice. And I think that with the reforms that are going on within administration of justice, within policing, within courts, that those opportunities are only going to expand uh, exponentially, exponentially. Mm -hmm. So just lots of opportunity. It's, uh, it's a degree field that can be used in lots of different. And since I was, I was talking to a girl today um, uh, on, a, on a walk this after my yoga class, and um, her husband uses his police skills, he's a retired police officer, to do security for um, mass transit. So that's another area. Um, I had a, another friend of mine who's a retired police officer who does the security for a hospital. Um, so this, this is a field that literally the sky's the limit. You could do anything. Yeah. yeah, there is. And what advice would you have for those current and future MCC students? come take one class at a time. Even if, even if you're working full time, and like I said, you're out of high school 10, 15 years, and you just don't know what career field you want to go into, mm -hmm. start with one class at a time. That's what I did. 
And I can tell you that starting with that one class will get you to the next class, to the next class. And sometimes those classes lead you to a career path that you didn't even know it was going to be there for you. You had no idea. So that would be, that would be my best advice is um, just, just start with one class. Even if you um, don't think that college is for you, you never know until you take one class. Well, thank you so much for answering our questions today. I really do appreciate it. We and do have additional bonus questions. These are our fun questions that okay. we like to Let's ask. It gets to it. know you a little bit better <laughs> as well. Okay. Um, okay. So we have 50 questions and right. we'd like you to pick a number one through 50. Okay, so I gotta, I'm gonna pick a different one, seven. Seven, what is your favorite Netflix show? Oh, well, my favorite show, I don't know if it's on Netflix or not, is Criminal Minds because yeah. profiling and all that kind of stuff. Yeah, I'm a Criminal Minds addict. Um, yeah. So, um, yeah, I don't I don't watch a lot of Netflix, but um, that would be the one I would pick whether it's on Netflix or not. Yes. No, I love that <laughs> show, too. It's so good. I, I'm a psych major, so I like kind of oh, understanding see, like why go. people do what they do. So it's really exactly. interesting. <laughs> yeah, what's the why? What's the why? Yeah. Yeah, what is the why? So okay, another one, one through fifty with the exception of seven. Um let's go with uh, I don't know. Uh fourteen. Fourteen. Seven. Okay. Would you rather travel back in time to meet your ancestors or to the future to meet your descendants? Oh, uh, well, since I don't have any children, I don't have any descendants. Um, so I would say I would like to travel back in time. Um, I, my father never got to see me turn 30 and my mom never saw me turn 40. So even if I could just go back and have breakfast with my mom and dad again, as oh. an adult, I would it would, uh, yeah, uh, uh, yeah, yeah. Yes. Oh, that would be and I, one of the best kind of treats. <laughs> right. And I never knew any of my grandparents except for my dad's father, my grandfather. The rest were already gone before I was born. So I, I don't know any of my grandparents, and I would love to go back and talk with them. Yeah, definitely. Yes, traveling back. I think I would do the same thing, too. Just go back and yeah. just meet with people and talk to them. Yeah. You may be more like like them than you even think you would be. Right? I know, right? <laughs> right? Yeah. Yeah. Well, Very true. thank you so much for um, participating with us today, Pamela. Um, so sure. thank you so oh, thank you so much again, Pamela, for participating in our faculty spotlight. This is such a wonderful opportunity for our students to get a peek into the field of interest and gain some very valuable knowledge from our, from your personal experience. Be sure to check out our other faculty spotlights. So be safe, stay healthy, and go Thunderbirds.